okay, Ode on a Grecian Urn, probably the one you didn't like the most. <laughs> um, you know, but there's so many important concepts in here. So again, he wrote it in 1819. Um, there, again, elements of the sonnet, five stanzas instead of eight stanzas in Ode to Nightingale, which is, I think, his longest ode. Uh, these are only five stanzas, but they're in ten lines. There's highly emotional language in this. We have apostrophe, he's talking to the urn. We have personification in the way that he's talking to the, the urn as a bride. It's a foster child. It's a sylvan historian. So we see personification. We also see in those first few lines metaphor as well by saying it's a foster child, by saying it's a sylvan historian. He is equating the urn to these things. So that's also metaphor. This is also an example of ekphrasis. You can see that word right there, which basically is a poem that gives a visual description of some kind of visual art. So a, a, a vase or a painting, you see a poem being written about it. He does have assonance here. So line 13, not the sensual ear, but more endeared. So we see sensual and n, and then ear and deared have that repetition of that vowel sound. And then alliteration in um, soft pipes play on. So again, we can see him playing with those. Um, the themes that we're going to be looking at here Immortality of art versus the transience of human life. Um, the paradox of figures frozen in time as they are depicted in being in motion, right? There are the contradictions, happy in pursuit but never satisfied is example of one of those, right? Um, thinking, did I write? Again, uh, nature, this is a pastoral, so we see him recreating nature scenes. We also see, again, beauty, and I think that's the big one here. Uh, this idea that beauty can bring us a sense of solace, and so the urn, a thing of beauty, provides truth to those who maybe see it, right? Uh, he also has another poem called Endymion. I've got it quoted here. A thing of beauty is a joy forever is the first line of Endymion, right? Um, that's important. If you look here at this quote on the side, this is from a letter that he wrote, I think Benjamin Bailey in 1817. He says, so what the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth, Right? So again, I think that's in that, you know, illusion versus reality. Even if it was illusion, if my imagination saw it, then that is true. There's beauty in that, right? So again, how is he defining beauty? Um, and one of the things is this poem ends in these two lines that is so controversial. People debate all the time what the heck they mean. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll get there when we, we see the end, right? So again, this is iambic pentameter, thou still unravest bride of quietness, the foster child of, false, of silence and slow time. Um, it get pretty regular, right? Um, so if we look at this first one, thou still unravest bride of quietness, if we look at the word still, is it still because it's not moving, it's, it's not animated, or is it still in terms of it's, it's, it's still unravished, it's, it's not yet ravished, right? There is a play on words there, right? And so he's a bride of quietness that no one has woken up. No one has changed that, right? He's a foster, the urn is a foster child of silence and slow time. So the urn is not human. It's not animated. So it's not influenced by time, nor is it something that can speak. And yet it does speak to us and it has lasted through time. So it's a foster child of those things, right? Sylvian historian, Sylvan historian. So Sylvan is a word that's associated with the woods, uh, so that nature, that pastoral, right? So it's a sylvan historian. It's a history of nature, right? Who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. So again, here's this idea that art or things that are close to nature are better than what humans can do, right? And so then he's going to ask us, he's going to ask it a bunch of questions. So he's speaking to the urn. He says, what leaf fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? So Tempe and Arcady are places in Greece, right? So we know that he visited the Elgin marbles in the British Museum. This is Lord Elgin uh, saved a bunch of Greek um, pieces of temples. A lot of pieces of the Parthenon are there and there are Greek, there, there are urns all over. We can't find the exact urn. We think that probably he was inspired by a bunch of different ones or he created this, but we do know that he went and spent a lot of time looking at this. So he is referring to one of these, right, that has all of these images painted on it, right? And so he's asking, what men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? 
what pipes and timbrels, what wild ecstasy. So he doesn't know. He's asking all of these questions about trying to interpret what he's seeing on the urn, right? And then he gives us a paradox. He said, heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. So therefore ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tune, right? So the sensual ear basically doesn't mean like, ooh, sensual. It just means like the, the ear that we have in our senses. And But how can you have music without tone, right? So he's saying that this one is bigger than our senses, right? It's speaking to um, a truth that's beyond perhaps our ability to understand it in our five senses. And that's kind of that negative capability, right? you got to understand and experience something and just give up all logic. And, he, and then he's again looking at the scene. He says, Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. So he's kind of giving us some juxtapositions here. Okay, yeah, you can't stop playing that song, but those trees will always be fully, beautifully in bloom, right? He says, Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss the winning near the goal yet. Do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not yet thy bliss, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. So again, here's these paradoxes, right? That, okay, you'll never get that kiss, you'll never quite catch the girl, but you'll always be in love as you are today, and she will always be as beautiful as she is. So this gives us, again, this idea of mutability. The urn is not mutable, it does not change. Human existence does. Love changes, beauty fades, right? And so, uh, you know, this is the contradiction. He sees these things frozen and he's not sure is it good, right? And then we have an emphasis on the joy in this eternal art. He says, oh, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy Love forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young. All breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. So again, think about the contradictions there. He's saying it's they're happy. The tree can't die. The song can't be old or, or the other musician get too tired to play. And the love will always be panting and throbbing and fresh. But then look, you'll also never have satisfaction, right? So again, this weird contradiction. And then he kind of really changes from this really highly passionate, exuberant stanza to something that's a little bit more calm. He says, who are these coming to the sacrifice? So he's turned it around. So there are three sides to this face. He's turned it and he's looking at something else. To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. So again, these contradictions, here these people are in a celebration to sacrifice to their God, to honor them. The cow is dressed with garlands, they're all up, but then the town is left behind. And there's no one to tell it why it's why it's desolate, why it's empty, and they can't return. So the next one, Attic. Attic refers to the region of, of Greece where Athens is. That's the Attic. Oh, Attic shape, fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed. Thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity cold pastoral. Ah, uh, so here's where we're getting into it. This is where people start going, what? <laughs> right? So again, he's, he's honoring it. It's got a beautiful attitude, right? So it's, it's beautiful in terms, I mean, attitude, think about in the shape of it, right? In breed just means the pattern, right? And he's talking about, look at all these, these men, these maidens, the, the nature, right? And he says, it's a silent form. And so again, here's this contradiction. It's silent. It, it isn't speaking, and yet it makes us, just as we ponder eternity, that we don't know the answer to what is eternity, right? We cannot grasp eternity. There is no way. And yet we think about it and it teases us out of thought, right? He says it's doing the same thing, right? So eternity and the urn are corrected. So art, art is eternal. 
right? As long as it lasts, and of course it can be destroyed, but as long as that, as that urn is intact, think about the hundreds of years that people will come to it and be able to see it, right? And experience it like Keats does, right? It says, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know, right? So that last part, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that's a chiasmus, C-H-I-A-S-M-U-S. That's an inversion where you, you have two kind of phrases, but you flip the other one around. So beauty is truth, truth beauty. So here's why this is in part contra uh, controversial. In the manuscript that his brother George wrote, right, um, the quotation mark ends after beauty. Beauty is truth, truth beauty in quotation. And then the rest of that line, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know is not in quotes. When it was um, published, right, um, no, I'm sorry. The published version had the end quote. The unpublished version, um, so you can see right here, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, end quote. That was the published version. The handwritten version of the, of the manuscript by George is punctuated like it is here in the typed lines, right? So the difference there is the urn is saying beauty is truth, truth, beauty. And then the poet, the narrator, is the one who says, and that's all you know, that's all you know, urn. And that's all you need to know, right? Whereas when the quotation is at the end of the line, at the end of the, the, the sentence, the urn is still speaking. And then he's saying that all you can know on earth, right? So you can't know this beyond, all you know is what's here on earth. You can't know eternity. You can't know what's coming after. So all you need to know is that beauty is truth and truth is beauty, right? So I think, and again, you get another teacher, they're going to tell you something different, probably. I think it's interesting that on line 45, he calls the urn a cold pastoral, right? That almost seems critical, right? That you're cold, you're not vibrant, you're not alive. And yes, you will remain, right? Even as other people have, you know, sorrows, you will be a friend who tells us that beauty is truth, beauty, but is then that last part, if you if we end the quotation at the end of that second beauty, is that then kind of the, because it's a cold pastoral, that's all it's going to know. It's not going to know all these other things that humans do, right? If you have it, that whole last two line is the quote, then this is it telling us something, right? So if we think about this, this quote, what the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth. That's, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to punctuate it as it is in the typed version when we look at that quote from Keats because that's what he would say, right? So beauty, we're not talking about beauty in terms of, you know, oh, you've got great hair and skin, right? We're talking about beauty in terms of its pure essence and, and, and truth is beautiful, right? Um, and if you can see that, if you can recognize it, then that's beautiful. And that provides us with comfort and solace. And that's why we go to art. That's why we read poetry. Because in the beauty that it invokes, there is some kind of connection. And again, this is what the romantics wanted to do, right? They wanted to um, pierce the veil between this world and the other world and be the translator for us so that we could understand the beauty of the world and want to act in ways that were truthful and beautiful as opposed to what we see in the city and all of the oppression and the gap in, um, you know, livable wages and things like that, right? The humans don't create beauty as much as nature does. And we have to go back and try to recreate beauty like nature does and get away from all of this artificial separations of status and, and privilege and things like that and treat people equally. Again, this is how Keats is really syncing with that romantic kind of ideal, All right? So um, I hope you enjoyed Keats. Um, it's okay if you didn't. Uh, just because I love these poets doesn't mean that you have to. Um, poetry is different from everyone. And who knows that, you know, in, you know, 
sometime in the future you may read this poem and you didn't like it now, but boy, it speaks to you, um, you know, when you are at a different part of your life. And that's why you can't stop reading poetry. That's why you can't stop reading poets that you didn't like maybe. Uh, you know, wait a bit and open up a book and see, wow. I mean, that's happened to me. I can't tell you how many times. Uh, Bartleby the Scrivener in American Lit by Melville. I hated that in American Lit as an undergrad. But when I took uh, American Short Story in graduate school, like, good Lord, probably 15 years later, I, I adore that story. It's because I changed. It's because I had a better understanding of what circumstances Bartleby was in and, um, and, you know, again, that can make all the difference. So, um, again, good luck with the test. Email me if you got questions. I'll be sending you out a study guide so that you can, um, you know, see what to do. But, again, the test is really straightforward. It's open book. Um, it, it's not tricky at all. But, again, I'm going to expect you to kind of understand, be able to point out examples of figurative language, uh, you know, or define what these terms are pick out themes, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, identify poems and things like iambic pentameter and that kind of stuff. So, again, if you've been taking